Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations. I'm your host, Furkan Dania. And as always, if anything in this episode resonates with you, or if you're looking for coaching services, I would love to hear from you. You can find me on Instagram at you know is then, or email me directly, lifecoaching at you know is In this week's episode, I'm excited to welcome Jared Saligan. Jared is an entrepreneur based in Calgary. And in this episode, Jared shares his journey of pursuing therapy and doing the hard work. Jared and I talk about how therapy can truly empower us and allow us to heal the parts of what we have hidden for years based on our past. As always, I hope you get a lot out of this episode. And if you can leave a five-star review at the end, I would truly appreciate it. All right, Jared, thanks for uh, joining me today and, uh, you know, coming on the Easy Conversations podcast. Uh, super grateful that you're taking the time and, oppor- and giving me the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, you know, we've connected recently and I've really enjoyed some of the conversations we've already had. But before we dive into uh, the episode today, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Uh, some of the work you're doing. And then, you know, we obviously want to talk about your journey with therapy, but yeah, just, uh, just for the listeners. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, first off, I just wanted to thank you as well. Like I've really enjoyed our conversations and it's just always good to have conversations around mental health and finding people that are doing, you know, similar things to you and in a similar space. So I've really appreciated our time, but um, yeah. So my name is Jared Salkin, born and raised in Calgary here. Uh, went to university, uh, actually did a bachelor of science, uh, mm-hmm. never going to use it. But while I was in <laughs> university, um, I fell in love with entrepreneurship. And so that kind of took me down an entrepreneurial path, did a whole bunch of just random things all over the place. Um, you know, I ran a painting business. I did a meal prep and delivery company, um, became a part owner in a restaurant, mm-hmm. uh, then worked in a tech startup for a little bit. And right around that time, right around when I hit 25, I kind of, you know, half jokingly coined it my quarter life crisis. And, you know, it basically, I realized that I wasn't happy with where I was at. And mm-hmm. I kind of kept running into the same problem that, you know, I told myself once I get here, um, I'll be happy. And then, you know, I would achieve that. And I'm like, okay, no, that wasn't a big enough goal. So I'm going to have to set my goal higher. And then I'd achieve that and go, no, okay, I have to set it higher. And what I realized was I kept falling into this pattern of no matter what I achieved, I was never, I never felt any different inside. And, you know, that was different from a lot of the messaging I had been told my entire life of, you know, you'll be happy when you're successful. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. And so, Again, going back to that quarter life crisis, started looking at myself, um, you know, realized I needed to make some changes, um, which I'm sure we'll kind of get into. And a big first step on that was, um, you know, starting to go to therapy mm-hmm. um, and realized that it was not a good environment for myself. Uh, so I, you know, again, kind of jokingly blew up my life, walked away from everything I'd been doing for the past, um, you know, five ish years. And, um, you know, with no real direction in mind, no idea where I was really going. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, I said, I'll figure it out. And, um, you know, that's kind of what brings me to today. Um, You know, one of the things I started when I was in that phase was my own podcast, which you were on, um, The Journey with Jared. Uh, Did that really as, you know, a way to have these conversations in public. Um, You know, a big piece of it for me was, one, it's scared. it was one of the scariest things I could do. Mm-hmm. I hated putting myself out there. I hated, you know, opening myself up for judgment. Yeah. Um, and so I really made the conscious effort to put a lot of the things I held shame around out into the light, out into the public, um, you know, for really for personal growth on my side and hopefully to help other people as well. Um, and then right now I have a little company that I started where I'm taking my grandma and mom's, um, you know, old pierogi recipe and, uh, packaging those and selling those online. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Ah, That's cool. Thank you for sharing all that. And, uh, it's interesting, right? So I guess with your podcast and, and 
kind of sharing your journey or, or trying to normalize some of the conversations that we talked about this before too, do you feel like it's kind of allowing you to achieve what you're kind of set your mind to in terms of making a difference and really uh, removing that aspect of shame like that? Are you feeling in itself, it's somewhat therapeutic, right? Um, having these conversations, like, do you feel that as well? For sure. And I mean, I started it almost two years ago now. And so the first year and a half was really, you know, scary for me, to be honest with you. And I really did force myself to talk about some of those subjects, which I'd held so deep down my entire life and I pushed them down, um, you know, kept them hidden. And really, you know, as I thought more about it, it was subjects that I was afraid people would find out about me, mm -hmm. right? And so going into things like, uh, you know, struggling with confidence or body image issues as a man was, was a huge one for me. And, you know, one that I felt very alone, mm -hmm. um, alone with for a very long time. Um, you know, sharing some of those things, you know, with the world, it removed that fear aspect, of like I said, I was afraid people were gonna find that out about me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so by me putting it back, putting it out there myself, it almost allowed me to take the power back from those things, those things mm -hmm. that I was afraid of, those things that I struggled with, um, that I was self-conscious about. Cause you know, in my mind I went, well, now it's out in public for anybody to see and anyone can find it. So I don't need to be afraid that, you know, people are gonna know it because in my mind, I'm just assuming that they already do. Yeah, it's been extremely therapeutic. And that was a huge piece of my journey for a very long time. Again, for that, you know, the past two, two years, really vulnerability was huge, because I was mm -hmm. never truly vulnerable with people. I had to, I've struggled with the idea of perfection of I had to be perfect to be yeah. worthy of love. And, you know, to be perfect, you can't have any flaws. And mm -hmm. so, you know, putting those out there really helped me get over that. Uh, I mean, still, still working through that a little bit, but it has been extremely therapeutic for myself. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because uh, recently I was reading about exposure therapy as part of the program I'm doing, and quite often what the research I came across was what they do with clients is try to get them to to simulate almost real life situations where the clients once they start. Um, experiencing those situations that they're afraid of and realize that, hey, they're, this is not as bad as I thought. And I've been running away from it for so long. In itself, when you start exposing yourself to the fear, uh, you, you're almost able to get over it, right? And then you can kind of like push the boundaries a little bit uh, of that fear slowly. And it sounds like that's what you were able to do uh, by really putting yourself out there and realizing that, hey, this is not as bad as I thought it would be. It's it's something I created in my own mind. For sure. And, you know, a, it was this almost like a stepped approach for me, too. And it kind of happened in phases. Mm -hmm. And the first one was with my therapist. The first one was admitting that to another human being. And yeah. going into those, having, you know, some of them identified for me. And, you know, a lot of them knowing that they were inside of me. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, talking about it with her. And then I joined a men's group. Um, which is was really one of the transformational um, experiences that I've had in my life. I was a part of that for about a year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so a little bit different, almost like a group therapy set, setting where um, there's 12 men that we became extremely, extremely close and knew, you know, our, each other's deepest, darkest secrets. And it was that safe of a space to do that. And, you know, through building those connections, I was able to then again share with a few more people. And then after doing that and having the support of them, that's when I felt ready to go out and kind of do it in public. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was a slow process. Um, but each time, you know, kind of to what you were saying, it showed me that it was okay. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the story that I told myself in my brain was, if anybody finds this out about me, they'll never like me. Yeah. If they knew this about me, you know, I'll be rejected. I'll be cast out. They won't talk to me. They'll think differently of me. And just having that proven again and again, to myself of, oh, you know, these people found this out or, you know, this thing that is so terrible yeah. and it actually has brought us closer together a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the whole, I guess, idea of vulnerabilities when you, you, 
you know, make yourself vulnerable, you're, you're kind of building that trust around other people and they can also be themselves around you. Right. And, and yeah. not put up that armor. Um, that's, I, again, that's really amazing. And I guess kind of sh going back a little bit, uh, you know, and we've talked about therapy and we've talked about the stigma that comes with it. And especially for men, um, there, there, again, there's that fear of admitting that, Hey, there's something I need to work on and exposing yourself in that sense. How was it for you? Like, what were some of the barriers you faced both internally and externally, uh, when you, what started that ther journey of therapy? For sure. And, you know, it kind of goes back to that period in my life where I realized I was doing the same thing over and over again, and I wasn't getting any different results. And it got to a point where I realized I went, I need somebody's help with this. Mm -hmm. um, I can't do it myself. I've tried, I've tried for years and these same things keep coming up and keep coming up and keep coming up. Um, but, you know, that again was a process in itself of, you know, probably a year of seriously knowing that I needed to talk to somebody before, you know, I built up the courage um, to actually do it. And it was, it's so funny of how differently I treat others as opposed to myself. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, a, su a huge proponent of therapy. And I thought it was amazing whenever somebody would tell me that they were going to therapy, it was, it was great. Like, good for you. Yeah. But as soon as it came to me, it was, you know, oh, I need help. You yeah. know, it was like that shame started creeping in. Like, it's great for everybody else, but not for me. And, um, you know, I actually didn't tell a soul in my life for, I think the first year. Um, and my sister, who's the closest person to me, um, mm -hmm. you know, in my life, I didn't even tell her, you know, who I could do basically anything and still be accepted and loved by her. Yeah. Um, I couldn't even bring myself to tell her. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was funny. I had built it up so much in my mind. I remember the day that I finally told her, it felt like I had to pump myself up. I was getting, you know, nervous. My heart yeah. was beating. And finally, I was just like, yeah, I started seeing a therapist. And she's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I was like, oh, <laughs> all that build up for nothing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, there is a ton of shame. You know, I think that I held around it. And um, as, like you said, especially for men, you know, seeing a therapist and, um, you know, you can be seen as weak or, you know, there's something wrong with you or mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, I, like it, it has honestly changed my mind or sorry, changed my life where mm -hmm. I started thinking about things differently. I started looking at myself. I started um, really tackling the root of the issues instead of just trying to deal with the symptoms. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's kind of been my journey with therapy as well is getting to the root and understanding that, you know, it's within you. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess in your case, it, very similar for me too, is just, you're constantly chasing something that that validation, um, whether it's try, through trying to achieve things or or setting goals, and and until you don't really sit down and look at okay where is this desire coming from, nothing will change. You're you're just gonna feel empty every time, and you know it sounds like you went through that similar journey too, and. Um, I guess one of the things I wanted to understand based on everything you're saying, so you had this fear of rejection and did, do you feel that prevented you from being yourself wholly around others as well because of that fear of rejection um, in, a, in a social setting too? For sure. And, you know, to give a little bit more context around it as well, of as I started, you know, going to sessions um, you know, I remember, I think it was our first session ever. And my therapist goes, you know, tell me about your childhood. And I go, mm -hmm. oh, we don't need to talk about that. Like, you know, I'm fine. Like I've dealt with that. I had a couple things. I got bullied a little bit, yeah. but like, that's fine. No, this is the issue. <laughs> and so we went, okay. And we went into that and then, you know, it just felt like we kept going layers and layers deeper because we went, no, this is the issue. And we talk about that and we go, oh no, that's actually coming from this. And we talk yeah. about that. And oh, that's actually coming from that. And I think, again, it was probably a good year, year and a half. It finally took us to circle back to my childhood. Mm -hmm. And through a lot of digging and going through a lot of, you know, those, those experiences and what it was like for me growing up, um, you know, I had always, it was funny, I had always told myself 
the story that, um, you know, my, my sister had a lot of troubles growing up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we had therapists come to our house and kind of do like family therapy, but it was always centered around her. Um, And, you know, so for me, it was like, oh, I wasn't the problem or, you know, I, I didn't need that. And what I found out, you know, through this journey of self-discovery was that because my parents had to spend so much time and energy on my sister, Mm -hmm. um, I essentially felt ignored, um, neglected, and really when it got down to the the root of it, um, I felt like I wasn't loved. Mm -hmm. And so that's where a lot of those feelings came from was, you know, these people, my parents, um, who are supposed to, you know, love me the most in the entire world, I felt like they didn't. Mm-hmm. And so if I wasn't worthy of getting love from my parents, how could I be worthy of getting love from anybody else mm-hmm. in this world? Yeah. And so that's kind of where, you know, as a 12 year old, I started making these decisions of, oh, in order to be worthy of love, I need to be perfect. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I couldn't be myself because, being myself was not perfect in the other person's eye. Right. right. That's the story that I would tell myself. And essentially what I would do is I would get to know the person that I was interacting with and see what was important to them, what they valued, what kind of personality I should have around them. You know, should mm-hmm. I be louder? Should I be softer? Um, you know, do they like, you know, houses? Okay. We'll talk about houses a whole bunch. Yeah. Do they like sports. We can talk about sports, whatever it was, I would, really tweak my entire personality right to something that they liked yeah so you're basically trying to be a chameleon right like yes. morphing yourself yeah so that's again like because you weren't seen as a child you know you tried to manifest that and and essentially it's it turns out to be people pleasing right yeah and and that just gets heavy after a while it gets exhausting um but yeah, so that's, and again, the, the root, obviously, for most of us, in fact, I f- believe, and we've talked about this, a lot of it just comes from childhood, right? So in yeah. your case, it started from there, and then it just carried into your adult life. And I, I guess it, it, in terms of all those goals and achievements, you were just trying to be seen, and, and because you weren't giving it to yourself, you weren't getting that validation. Exactly. And, you know, seeking that validation from others and from those external factors. Um, And, you know, that's going back to it. That was the problem was because I'd get that validation from others. I would get those external achievements and I wouldn't actually feel any different on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so the story I told myself for a long time was, oh, I need to set that higher. I need to achieve more. I need to do better. And really one of the turning points for me was again, because I shifted my personality to the person that I was with, because I was trying to impress them, I was trying to gain their approval. Mm -hmm. I asked myself if the roles were reversed, you know, if, you know, in, in the future when I'm, you know, 50, 60 years old and I'm, um, you know, somebody that another person is trying to do that to, that they're trying to learn from that, you know, they look up to me as more of a mentor. Who would I be if I'm not trying to impress them? And I didn't have an answer. Mm -hmm. I had no idea of who Jared is, who I would be if I was just going to be myself. And that was really one of the the turning points of, oh, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess when you started going for therapy, like, you know, if you don't mind sharing, like, what were some of the things that you learned about yourself and you were able to do that allowed you to kind of shift your perspective on life and and recognize some of the, the, the maladaptive behaviors or even the negative beliefs you had about yourself. Like what were those things and, and how yeah. have you been able to now moving forward, been able to build that into your life? Yeah, you know, I think one of the biggest ones and the first one that comes to mind is I realized that I pushed down every single emotion that I ever had. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it was a survival mechanism really because there were so many emotions that were coming up, you know, you go, you don't want to feel these bad feelings Mm -hmm. anymore. Now, Mm -hmm. the problem with that is that you can't just, you know, filter through the bad feelings and then leave the good ones. You have to shut all of them off. Mm 
-hmm. And so I pushed them down, pushed them down, pushed them down to essentially when I didn't feel anything, but I would have these huge emotional outbursts of something seemingly small. All of a sudden I would have like a blow up and now a blow up came in many different ways, you know, either extreme anger or extreme sadness or Mm -hmm. whatever it might be. And, you know, I, I didn't want to live like that anymore. And as I started to kind of peel that back and start to allow myself to feel the emotions, I realized the deep pain and again, shame that I held around myself um, and just how bad of a view I had on myself too, which was Mm -hmm. a really, um, a really tough kind of pill to swallow. Mm -hmm. of not realizing how little I thought of myself, how low my self-worth was. And really, you know, at the, at the core of it, feeling like I hated myself. Mm -hmm. So realizing those, how strong those feelings were, how much there was actually going on of one, as I started uncovering those, I couldn't cover them back up. Mm -hmm. You know, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And so that kind of forced me to continue on the path. The other side of it and kind of what started off in the beginning was actually the professional side of me mm-hmm. going, I want to unlock my full potential. And I, if I work through a lot of these things, I'll be able to achieve so much more. And I was able to use that at the beginning as the motivation to keep going. Now that's shifted a lot because my, my feelings around success and my feelings around happiness and um you know, the professional realm have changed. I mm-hmm. still, you know, value it a ton and um, want to be, you know, quote unquote successful, but that success is, looks very different to me now. Right. And so, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's funny of, as I, as I had, you know, that kind of turning point in my life, externally, I was doing the worst that I ever had. Financially, from a Um, you know, a title standpoint, um, from when people were uh, on the outside looking in, it was the worst place I'd ever been. However, internally, it's the best I'd ever felt. Mm -hmm. And so that contradiction also made me realize that what was truly important and that I needed to work on some of these demons and work through them and that I still have a lot of life ahead of me and I can't live it the way that I was living it before. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think the intrinsic motivation changed. um, And and that's kind of still allowed you to define things differently. Like you said, like success for you means something completely different now. It's about how you feel about yourself. And that's amazing because then once you get to that point, I I believe, you know, like the external stuff just becomes white noise. And how you feel about yourself is the most important thing. And I think there's a lot of power in that. Um, And I guess like moving forward and stuff like that, like what kind of goals have you set for yourself where you know, okay, obviously there's that fear of falling back into that trap. And and in all honesty, even for myself, I do fall into it on some days, right? And and just having that awareness now and having the tools um, to be able to, kind of crawl back out of it I've been able to manage it right because I've I've learned I've been in these situations before and I know what it takes me from a mindset perspective on how to drag myself out and and how to like focus on different things um but yeah in your case what are those things uh like how do you hold yourself accountable when you know you're falling back into it what what's what are some of the things you remind yourself of and and how do you hold yourself accountable yeah, um, I think a big one that has changed for me was one accepting that I do have depressive episodes mm-hmm. and, you know, like just being okay with that mm-hmm. and, you know, again, not, not trying to deny them, not trying to put too much weight onto them, just, you know, having it as a fact of like, okay, you know, sometimes this happens. And one that has really helped me is being okay with the bad days. Yeah. And not trying to overjudge them of, you know, okay, today I'm feeling off today. I'm feeling down today. I'm feeling sad today. I'm feeling agitated, whatever it might be Mm -hmm. and not labeling it or putting too much meaning into it. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. This was the day. 
yeah. and then waking up tomorrow and okay, I feel, I feel fine again. And checking in with myself like that also allows me to identify when it's starting to become a rut mm-hmm. of, okay, now I felt off for, you know, three days a week, whatever it might be. Yeah. Okay. I think something else is going on. And then it's more, it's more um, investigation. All right. Is there something specifically that happened? Is there something I've been thinking about? Is there something that's come up mm-hmm. and working through that? And a lot of times I'm able to identify it, kind of work through my feelings around it uh, in all different ways. You know, sometimes it's just the mental exercise of identifying it. Sometimes it's, um, you know, journaling on it. Yeah, um, yeah. Not very often, but I, I do use meditation sometimes if I really need to kind of go in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's a huge one for me is just been checking in on myself, not over judging or putting too much weight on days when I'm off or down. Yeah. Um, yeah. for me, I still see my therapist quite regularly about once a month and, mm-hmm. you know, that's always a really good reset for me. I'm able to talk, uh, you know, talk things out and she really is able to, you know, allow me, she really challenges me intellectually mm-hmm. and allows me to understand it. Um, leaning on my support system has been huge. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, a lot of those guys that I was in the men's group with and other people that I have met in my life that I'm able to have real conversations with Mm -hmm. of, hey, let's go for a coffee. I need to talk this out and whatever that might be. And, you know, because I have that trust in them, Mm -hmm. because we both have the trust in each other, we've both shared, we're able to have those real conversations and just get into it without, you know, all the surface level stuff getting in the way. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's amazing. And it resonates for me on so many different levels. And I think, and I've mentioned this in other episodes as well. I think the biggest shift for me was, you know, again, it comes with perfectionism, right? Like when you have an off day, you're almost denying it and you feel guilty and and shame for even having an off day. Right. And one of the shifts I've made over, especially you know, during the pandemic, it was hard. Like there's some days where I just feel down, you know, and I didn't have uh, like the ability to go do things that I normally would, right? Like when the gyms were closed, I couldn't go work out or go play basketball and feel better. And the shift really happened when I started giving myself permission to feel. Yeah, if I'm feeling down, I started giving myself permission to feel that fully and accept it and tell myself that, okay, I'm allowed to have this off day or a couple of off days, but that's it, (laughs) you know, set a timeline. It's like, okay, it's okay to feel this way, but don't let it drag out for too long. And if I started feeling, like you said, if I started feeling like it was dragging on for more than a couple of days, that's when I knew I needed to go see my therapist. And I really needed a, a, you know, someone's help to shift things around in my mind. And, and similar to you, my therapist will challenge me intellectually. Just give me a different perspective to focus on so I can like see things differently. Right. And I've found that to be really powerful in the sense where, again, just giving myself that permission um, yeah. and telling myself, OK, this is not going to stay here forever. Like something happened, I'm feeling off, maybe something from the past came up, uh, I'm triggered, whatever it is, let myself feel it. And then I'll use the tools I have, like you said, journaling, meditating, going for a run, exercise, whatever it is. And if I can't do it on my own, that's when I know I need to to get that help. And, And because I've normalized it for myself, it's easy for me to access it, right? So for sure. And that's, that's huge. And I just want to, you know, as you're talking there, the other thing that came up, um, which to your point, allowing yourself to feel things was huge for me. Um, you know, I had always told myself that I don't have an addictive personality. You know, I'd never tried a drug in my life. Like I don't have an addictive personality, but what I came to realize is I do, I, you know, used other things and really what it was, was ways to numb out. Mm -hmm. And when I was starting to feel, you know, things coming up for most of my life, it's like, okay, let's numb out. Um, You know, so like for me, a big one was like drinking Mm -hmm. or eating or even like porn, right? Mm -hmm. Again, which lots of shame, lots of guys hold shame around. Um, And realizing that those activities were actually 
to distract me from my feelings and to numb out so that I didn't have to deal with them. And so for me during COVID, it was, I basically cut all of those out of my life um, so that I could feel them and mm -hmm. almost lock myself in my room. And it's just like, no, we're going to work through these things. We're going to feel these things. We're going to go to the dark places that I've avoided for a very long time. Um, but just allowing yourself to feel those is, is huge. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's part of all of it, right? It's, it's not only accepting the things you need to work on and, and getting to the root of it. It's also giving yourself the, you know, again, like I said, the permission to feel those things when they come up, because that's part of the journey. It's not like, and we talked about this, you can't just get up one day and everything's gone. It's like, you know, a clean slate. You're still going to get triggered. There's still going to be new things that may come up in your life. And you need to be able to not only seek help, but allow yourself to feel those emotions. Yeah. And whether they're really strong emotions or whatever they are, you need to be able to allow yourself to feel it and accept it and, and not blame others for it, but really look within yourself. And I think once you start getting to that point, it's easier to even work through it. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, a big piece of it for me was how, having self-compassion as well, mm -hmm. of having the self-compassion that it's okay that I have these feelings and almost taking away the right or wrong around the feelings. You know, it's, there's no, you know, feelings aren't right or wrong. There's no proper feelings. The feeling is real because you're having it. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at that. And where is it coming from? Why am I feeling like this? Um, but it's okay. Yeah. And just not being so hard on myself because I realized just how much I'd beat myself down of mm -hmm. adding that extra pressure. Of, oh, I shouldn't feel this way. Oh, I shouldn't do this. Oh, I should be better at this. And just having a little bit of that self-compassion was huge for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I find what's helpful when I do go for therapy is the role playing where my therapist will play the role of being me. And, and then, you know, like being like, okay, this is what I believe about myself. And she'll repeat all the things I believe about myself. And then she'll be like, well, tell me a different perspective. And when I do automatically, I start feeling like, okay, that's, it, it's crazy. Like when you put yourself in another person's shoes and you think about all the negative things you're saying to yourself, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, no, that's not true. And that's, I think that's where that compassion piece comes in. When you start having that compassion for yourself, it makes a huge difference. Uh, but sometimes you need that shift in perspective or, or you need to look at it from another person's viewpoint to really recognize how, how harmful it is and the way we speak to ourselves, right? It's, 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 <laughs> it's pretty sad sometimes when you think about it, right? And, and you need that, uh, I guess, kind of different outlook or different perspective. For sure. And, you know, I think one of the things that has stuck with me for a really long time is, you know, would you treat yourself or sorry, would you treat others the way that you treat yourself? Mm -hmm. And that one really hit me where I go, no, there's no way I would ever say those kinds of things to anybody else. Right. Um, but, you know, I pound myself at those all day, every single day. Mm -hmm. So that's where, yeah, that again, it was a huge perspective shift and really just having that self-compassion come in being a little bit easier um, you know, like treating myself like I would treat somebody else, which is so funny, you know, where yeah. you, think you treat yourself with the most kindness, um, uh, where a lot of times that's not the case. No, no. And I guess kind of shifting gears now, like moving forward with all the work you've been doing, like, what are some of the things, you know, like you, you foresee taking on and, and like, what are your goals moving forward, uh, in terms of really building on everything you've done to date in terms of working on yourself. Yeah. And, you know, I'm funny where I don't like specific goals. And so yeah. I struggle a lot of times with that. Um, but for a very long time, this last phase, you know, in my personal development journey, I've spent a lot of time looking back, mm -hmm. you know, looking back at my childhood, looking back at past patterns, um, realizing where they came from, everything that we talked about today. And so this next phase is looking forward mm -hmm. and it's trying to determine who, who do I want to be? What kind of man do I want to be? What do I mm -hmm. want my life to look like? 
Yeah. And really what I've been struggling with lately is now that I'm not trying to live my life for other people, what do I actually want? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so exploring that has been really um, hard and amazing at the same time. Um, you know, frustrating, but again, I, I feel like I am moving in the right direction, but I don't know specifically where that's going to be. Mm -hmm. I know that it is, you know, mental health, uh, is going to be a huge part of my life moving forward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having those conversations with people is still very important to me. Um, you know, offering safe spaces is very important to me and, again, just kind of cutting through the bullshit that a lot of us live. And yeah. so, you know, I've really made the commitment to have those kinds of relationships to offer people that kind of space, how that shows up in my life. I don't know. Um, yeah. And yeah, so right now I'm still trying to figure that out, but I'm excited for the future and, and looking forward for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's amazing. And I, I guess one of the things that maybe just throwing it out there, I think, uh, when you start having that, you know, focus on yourself and, and almost in a way living for yourself, I think there's a, an aspect of shame that comes with that too, right? It almost feels like you're being selfish. Um, and I've really had to work around that too over this year because of all the kind of shifts in my thinking pattern I've made and recognizing that and we've talked about this is again, focusing on my own happiness and, and giving myself that happiness, validating myself before I can even focus on anyone else. Right. And uh, one of the cool analogies I heard a few months ago was it's like, it's like when you're on an airplane, right. And even if you're traveling with your child, they tell you when the oxygen masks drop, put yours on first before you can help even your own child, right? And I remember like being on planes and like thinking about it and I was like, this is ridiculous. Like my instant like reflex would be to like make sure my son is like wearing his mask, right? But when you apply that to almost anything in your life, if you're not really loving yourself or taking care of yourself or not validating yourself and finding that happiness within you, how can you give it to anyone else? And I think, you know, that's where I feel like it's not selfish. It's, it's almost like in order to be with other people, you need to be able to do that for yourself. I don't know what your thoughts are, but that yeah. really required me to really shift the way I looked at it because initially, again, making certain tough choices in my life for my own happiness, I felt shame. I felt guilty, but I had to really work hard to, to navigate through that. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I follow, but my first kind of experience with thinking about this was um, I follow Gary Vee and he yeah. talks about being selfish to be selfless mm -hmm. and that by being selfish, you know, the way that I took it, at least by being selfish, by working on yourself, by doing the things that you're good at, the things that you enjoy, it actually allows you to be more selfless. And it was very, it was very cool in my own life where as I started working on myself, as I started taking more space, as I started putting up boundaries, you know, things that I thought I could never do, mm -hmm. right? Again, of that, like, I need to help others. I need to, you know, give my all to others. You know, I come last. As I started to put myself first, it was very funny how I actually became closer with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I was able to help them even more. And I was able to see that almost like a black and white example um, pretty early on in my work, um, which really just kind of allowed that point to set in mm -hmm. that, um, you know, again, showing different sides of myself, showing that I had imperfections made them feel more safe, made them mm -hmm. feel that, you know, I was more relatable, that we could actually go to those places. Um, and then just by taking that space and having that time for myself, I was able to truly help them instead of just being there, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of being there 50%, you know, I was able to be there 90%. Yeah. And so it was it's such an important point and is so true that you need to work on yourself in order to be able to help other people. And there's nothing wrong with the quote unquote being selfish, mm -hmm. um, you know, 
if you're doing it for the right reasons. Yeah, yeah, hundred uh, percent. Jared, I mean, I've really enjoyed this conversation, and uh, you know, I, I think this is like number two for us, so it's been great. Um, yeah, and I guess for for listeners that want to get a hold of you or reach out to you, uh, and I know you have your own podcast as well. Um, yeah, what's what are the best ways? either social media or, or online to, to find you for sure um so basically the same across all social media uh it's just my name jared salikin um instagram is probably where i'm most active mm -hmm. so if you want to reach out there and then yeah like you said i do have my own podcast called the journey with jared um it's on anywhere that you get your podcasts so um you know i dive into a lot of a lot of these similar topics, uh, mm -hmm. mental health, you know, modern masculinity, uh, a little bit of entrepreneurship. Um, yeah, but always love connecting with people, always open for um, questions or conversations or challenges. And so, yeah. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I guess before we, we end this, is there anything you want to say to people who are kind of in a similar situation or, you know, really struggling with it? Um, like, you know, like you said, the not like struggling with the ability to be themselves or or just chasing that constant success but feeling empty like what what kind of words would you like to share with people yeah i would say it's it's a race that you'd be running for your entire life mm -hmm. you'll never get there mm -hmm. when you're seeking that external validation um no matter what you achieve no matter what you do um it'll never be enough. There'll, mm -hmm. there'll always be more. There's always more you can do. There's always more money you can make. There's always more people you can impress. And even if you do feel, you know, that hit of dopamine for a little bit, it won't mm -hmm. be sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say that the journey of actually, <laughs> you know, looking in at yourself and, you know, um, doing this type of work is hard. It's yeah. extremely difficult. It's the hardest work I've ever done. And it truly is life-changing. I feel like a different person. I feel like I don't know how long I would have been able to continue and what my life would look like if I didn't start this work. And so mm -hmm. even though it is very, very difficult and nobody can do the work for you, it's worth it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's amazing. Thanks, Jared, I appreciate it. And thank you again for coming on. And I'm sure we're gonna be talking more, but you know, uh, really appreciate you taking the opportunity, uh, the time to do this. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was, it was a great conversation. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. As always, please subscribe to the podcast if you enjoy the episodes or leave a comment in the comment section. I always love hearing from you. Thank you again. And until next week.